ministers over the weekend agreed on a historic plan to make sure the world's biggest companies can no longer dodge their taxes. The plan, which was backed by some 130 countries, was propelled by concerns that tech giants like Amazon, Google and Facebook aren't paying enough in taxes. The two pillars of this global tax scheme will therefore make companies pay up in countries where they have sales and no matter where they shift their profits, a, mini a minimum of uh, corporate tax of 15% will apply to firms with turnovers above $889 million. Now, this may all sound reasonable in theory, but of course, the devil is in the details. So which countries will actually implement this plan from um, 2023 and how this will be implemented is still under question. So the question really is, can they do it and will it work? Today, we connect with Chun Zog Oh, Professor of Business Administration at Sung Young Women's University, and Lorraine Eden, Professor Emerita of Management at Texas A&M University's May Business School. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And well, we have a lot to talk about today, so let's go straight into the discussion. And uh, starting with you, Professor O, oh, joining us in Seoul. Now, many are calling this tax reform a historic plan. The French uh, finance minister called it a once in a century tax revolution. So, first of all, really, what is the significance of this deal? And after years and years of talks, what was the catalyst that really uh, drove this deal through? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Suyong. Uh, let's start with significance first. In a meeting of G20 Minister of Finance uh, as of uh, July 1st, uh, they agreed an OECD pillar one and two. Uh, it is a, a sensational uh, or revolutionary in two respects. One is uh, changing packing order of international taxation principle, and second one is introducing, uh, as Suyong mentioned, that uh, global minimum corporate tax, uh, especially a target for a digital tech company. Uh, basically, international tax principle tells which country has the power to levy tax, and then there are two principles. Uh, one is the region country principle, and then uh, second is a source country uh, principle on condition uh, where there is a, a PE. Uh, till now, uh, the packing order is a resident, uh, resident country principle first, and then uh, after that, uh, the source country principle applied. Uh, but uh, as to the introduction of OECD Pillar 1 and 2, uh, the, uh, they try to establish the, the uh, changing the, this kind of international taxation regime. Uh, and, and then uh, what factors uh, do the role uh, of the catalyzer uh, that I may say that uh, for three reasons. One is COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic could touch the triggers of finding a new tax base. Uh, it's like uh, the, the cutting a cake uh, at table. And then uh, once uh, the uh, residence uh, country principle uh, applied, then the rest is a source country principle. Oh. Uh, but uh, uh, nowadays, uh, as to uh, the urgency of the economy, uh, this kind of pecking order has changed. It. Uh, governments need uh, more money to inject fuel in an economy, uh, whether in the name of the universal basic income or a small, uh, small business supporting uh, fund. Uh, second one is uh, till now that uh, global digital tech companies are blamed to be less burdened uh, in spite of rapid growth of uh, global sales under this kind of uh, distress or hardships. It is right time uh, introducing digital tax, uh, whether in the form of digital transaction tax or digital service tax or digital pla uh, platform tax whatsoever. Uh, and the third is the Biden administration's return to multilateralism, uh, which is different from the uh, bilateralism of uh, Trump administration. You know, bilateralism uh, is a competition strategy. Uh, they uh, might be compete uh, over, uh, win over uh, their rivalry, but you know, multilateralism cooperation strategy, international cooperation is uh, important, and then uh, rather than one-to-one -one bargaining power, then multilateralism respect the international standard in harmony with other countries. So uh, in this respect, that uh, this kind of uh, tax revolution, uh, revolution uh, happens. Right, so there was a need for this and there was this political will that also drove it through. And Professor mm -hmm. Eden, now under the current rules, uh, global companies, they pay taxes in countries where they uh, do operations. But under the new plan's first pillar, 
uh, countries where their customers reside, um, they're also going to gain the right to tax these firms. And this so-called amount A principle, um, it means that the pie is going to be shared by more countries. And obviously that would require uh, very carefully coordinated slicing. So how exactly would this system work and who are going to be the winners and the losers from this? Well, thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, let me say this is, it is a very complicated package as you've heard Professor O start to talk about. Under the existing rules, in corporate income tax was divided up based on residence principles and source principles, and basically not on where things were sold. And so if there were no permanent establishment, no subsidiary or branch in a country, but there were sales, in effect, you couldn't tax them. They would be taxed somewhere else. And that didn't really matter in the old days. In the old days, when you exported into a country and didn't have a subsidiary there, they were treated as exports and you simply put on a, a tariff. But now with the industry 4.0 and the digital revolution, we have the rise of these enormous multinationals that we call the digital multinationals, the, the born digitals. And they, in effect, don't have to have a physical location in order to make their sales. And under the current system, in effect, those profits are not taxed. There may be advertising revenue, but that may be somewhere else. So the whole idea here was to basically say, let's change the existing system that's been in place for more than 100 years and open up to the possibility of levying taxes where in effect products are sold, even if there's no multinational subsidiary or branch in that location. Now, how do you do it? Well, the proposal under amount A basically says take a country and look at the sales in that country as a percent of worldwide sales of that multinational. So suppose we take a country and its share of Walmart sales is, it has 2% of Walmart's worldwide sales. And Walmart does not have a subsidiary there. So no profits are declared there. So right from the start, this country has the ability to take 2% of the amount A pie because 2% of the sales are there and there's no profits being declared. Uh, on the reverse side, think about a tax haven. In a tax haven or an investment hub, maybe 10% of the profits are being put there, but there's no sale. And so the opposite happens. All of a sudden, that country finds that its profits are going to be shifted out. So basically, the, the, the amount A looks at your sh a country's share of sales of a particular multinational compared to the share of profits that are declared there. When sales are greater than profits, money will be moved in. Tax base will be moved in. When profits are growing, the share of profits is greater than the share of sales, then profit base will be moved out. And that's how the idea is supposed to work. That's the simplest way to sort of think of it. And Professor O, now countries are trying to figure out what impact this will have on their biggest companies. And well, when it comes to South Korea, there we have, the, uh, we have these uh, big tech firms like Samsung and uh, SK Hynix. How would these companies be affected and how would this in turn affect the South Korean economy? Uh, So-called, it is uh, the time of a big blur uh, with the introduction of uh, this kind of uh, tax revolution uh, that, as uh, Suyong mentioned, that uh, Samsung or uh, SK Hynix will be vulnerable uh, to uh, another type of uh, international taxation risks. Uh, pillar 1 and uh, Pillar 2. Uh, pillar 1 consists of reassigning a part of the income tax paid by the multinationals uh, to their market economies first. Uh, namely the country where they conduct their business. Uh, and the uh, professor even comment about that uh, this pillar targets business with a uh, gross global turnover of more than uh, $20 billion and a profitability, uh, profitability rate of over 10%. Uh, in Korea, uh, Samsung Electronics and then SK Hynix uh, will be included in this category. And then uh, there might be kind of uh, vulnerability uh, to this kind of risks. Uh, go to Pillar 2. Uh, pillar 2 corresponds to the establishment of an effective minimum tax rate of at least 15% on transnational earnings. It would uh, enable a resident country to impose 
more additionally compensatory taxes if that uh, company paid less than the 15 minimum tax rate in its market country. Uh, so pillar two uh, covers uh, and then uh, pillar two generate uh, another type of uh, extra burden for multinational companies in uh, major Korean companies, uh, which uh, establishing the global value chain around the world. Uh, in conclusion, Pillar 1 and uh, Pillar 2 stress more on uh, source income principle, uh, which might uh, be uh, more uh, exposed to other source countries' uh, tax risks, uh, which will increase the double taxation risks for uh, the Korean global companies afterwards. Well, so Professor oh, so how are the businesses in here in South Korea and the Korean um government as well, how are they preparing to sort of minimize the impact that this may have on them? <laughs> it's very hard to answer, but the uh, Korean government uh, till now uh, take a cautious measure uh, and then uh, keep in line with the international standard. Uh, think about it, uh, the status of Korea uh, in the international arena uh, is not a, a big power. So uh, uh, from the perspective of a Korean government, uh, within the framework of uh, multilateralism, uh, Korea can participate in the discussion of rules setting, and then uh, it might be get a chance to voice up uh, for a Korean interest uh, uh, in the arena of uh, multilateralism. But if Korea uh, hastily uh, and then hurriedly uh, participate in the bilateral uh, framework, the other country force Korea to decide which side are you in or uh, 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 you might uh, get out of uh, 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 the other uh, partner side. So at this, uh, at this moment, uh, Korean government uh, take and then keep in contact with the multilateralism, I might say. And Professor Eads, and obviously not all countries are happy about this plan. Um, countries like Ireland, where they have very uh, low tax rates. Um, how do you think they're going to really respond to these measures? I mean, it's going to obviously have some substantial impact on their uh, economies. Well, I think the issue is whether we're talking about Pillar 1 or Pillar 2 here, but I think particularly with Ireland, Ireland's worried about Pillar 2. The proposal for a minimum corporate income tax rate of 15% on profits uh, when Ireland's rates 12 and a half, uh, and many countries, all the investment hubs and um, the tax havens typically would have rates well below that, right? And so any of these countries would all of a sudden uh, either find that the residents, in other words, where the parent firms reside, that home country is going to levy a minimum tax of 15%. And um, the impact then would be, could well be that many multinationals, if they had no other reason to be there, would leave that country. Ireland, I think, is in a slightly different case than many of the others. Um, many of the multinationals have been in Ireland a very long time. There's a very sophisticated labor force. Uh, Ireland has access to the European Union. Uh, there are many ways, many reasons to be in Ireland or Luxembourg or Switzerland. Uh, or the Netherlands, for example, other than the tax rate. On the other hand, many of the tax havens, the small Caribbean islands that we talk about, for example, and some of the other investment hubs that really have no other reason for the multinationals to be there other than to be a place where they hide profits, they are, are, are going to be under a serious pressure. And um, in effect, many of them, of course, are not OECD member countries, um, and, and we'll have to think about if this goes through and does affect them, what they themselves do. In my own work on this, um, I have argued that putting on a 15% minimum tax or 12 and a half or 10 or whatever the rate is, does offer some of these countries the opportunity to raise their own tax rates and end their own race to the bottom in the following way. If their taxes are fully creditable against the home country tax, then there's a really clear advantage if everyone's in and everyone plays by the rules for the very small countries to raise their rate. Now, let me give you an example, for example. So suppose we took a small Caribbean island and currently its tax rate is zero. It raises its money in other ways and has very little to grow that economy and to train its labor force, create universities, provide infrastructure. On the other hand, if the minimum rate is 15 and everybody has a minimum rate of 15, that country can levy a rate of 15 too. 
and then use those revenues to actually fund some of the infrastructure and growth. Um, but that only works if everyone's in, no one cheats the system, and there is a reason to be there in the first place. Uh, if the only reason for the firm to be there, for the multinational to be there, is to avoid paying tax, I think there will be a lot of capital flight out of these havens. And then there will be a major pressure on, on what to do about for these countries with the loss in income. Well, it sounds like there's a lot to talk about and a lot of adjustments to be made, a lot of details to be nailed out within the next three months. And well, I'm afraid due to time, this is where we must end the interview today. But that was Chun Sogo, Professor of Business Administration at Sungyong Women's University in Seoul and Lorraine Eden, Professor Emerita Thank of you. Management at Texas A&M University. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.